everybody is networking and talking, but just because the time is great, we want to respect all the panelists and give everybody a fair amount of time. Everybody will have a chance to talk and, and communicate at intermission. Um, so please, can we just all get to our seats? Thank you so much, and we're going to get started. Thank you. Okay, so this panel is called Revolutionary Intercommunalism and Our Global Struggle for Peace. It is imperative that we recap what the idea of revolutionary intercommunalism is. It is in regard to the world struggle, where the issues that we as humanity face transcend borders and isn't exclusive to one group. Components of this theory of the understanding of the world are globalization and all it entails. Um, as the effects of hegemony on those who capitalism has oppressed continue, there is the idea that there needs to be a liberation of all people, the liberation of humanity. There needs to be support in the world's struggle for peace and equality, where the freedom of the black and brown are to be simultaneous. This includes black Americans and all diasporic people to the oppressed in Palestine and Venezuela alike. Liberation for these people should not be limited to each cleavage of identity. Through these struggles, we are connected, and as humanity, it is our responsibility to understand that and combat that together as a collective unit for the betterment of humankind worldwide. Um, we're going to start the panel off with Samir El Amin, the Vice President of Temple Students for Justice in Palestine. He will be followed by Dalia Waswi, an Iraqi American justice activist, and then we will have Danny Haifong, the journalist for the Black Agenda Report, and then lastly we'll have Meghna Chandra, a member of the Saturday Free School and the Upper Darby Worker Center. So we have Sam right here. So I'm here to talk about uh, revolutionary intercommunalism. Um, so to start it off, I'll start um, basically where the theory um, originated. So between 1971 and 1972, um, Huey traveled across the world and met lots of different uh, world leaders, um, particularly uh, two of the ones I can remember is the president of Mozambique and the Chinese premier. Um, in a wake of this trip, um, he came back and reframed his methods to meet the needs of the community outside of just rhetoric um, or armed revolt. Um, so the party started out as black nationalists but they realized that nationhood was impossible unless they were able to become the dominant force. Um, so they basically understood they existed as a dispersed colony, the summation of all people in the world struggling for decolonization and nationhood. They recognized that they don't have geographical concentration that the other colonies had. Um, the black communities were pretty much spread all over the United States, but they weren't concentrated enough um, to fight for nationhood. Huey recognized this. Um, he recognized that revolutionary nationalist wasn't enough because the oppressors were using the same economic system across the world. There isn't a single nation that needs fixing but the entire world. Um, because of this, they called themselves revolutionary internationalists. But there are certain things you need to be a nation. Ethnic identity, religion, divide by some partition of water or great uninhabited land. Um, technology kind of transformed this in like, the way we define nationhood. Settlers went everywhere across the world and extracted resources and labor from seized land. Once in control, the oppressed people are so integrated into the system that the settlers' presence isn't necessary anymore. The United States has surpassed nationhood by the materialist perspective and is now an empire. Um, there are no more colonies and neo-colonies. It must be possible to decolonize if something is a colony. But when all resources and extracted labor are dispersed all over the entire globe, when the giant machine of industry, uh, when the riches of the world are systematically depleted to feed the giant machine of industry, people of the world are so integrated into the world economy that it's impossible to simply decolonize and return to previous conditions. Nationhood is an immaterial concept that doesn't currently exist in the eyes of the materialist. Because of this, nationalism or revolutionary nationalism doesn't make sense because the end goal of nationhood is impossible. The world today is a dispersed, collection of communities. The, the world today is a displaced, dispersed collection of communities, and this is why we call it intercommunalism. We're now in the age of reactionary intercommunalism, in which a small circle of elites dominates the world's natural resources via their technology. However, Huey believed that technology could be used for good, 
it can solve the problems and material contradictions that people have. It can allow for people of the world to develop a culture that is essentially human. It would nurture our ability to solve these deep contradictions. And this culture will be called revolutionary intercommunalism. So intercommunalism and its relevance today, um, I'm going to talk about the anti-war movement or a lack of an anti-war movement, um, particularly in Yemen, Palestine, Syria, Libya, and Iraq. Um, there's a lot more places that I could talk about, but um, this is my area of expertise, um, so I'm just going to keep it with these countries. Um, and keep in mind, when I talk about this movement and the actors involved in both sides of the struggle, um, it's through the perspective of a dialectical materialist. Um, dialectical materialism examines the subjects of the world in relation to each other within the dynamic evolutionary environment, in contrast with metaphysical materialism which examines the parts of the world within a static, isolated environment. Today we find a lack of anti-war movement in the United States. Not only a lack of movement, but there's a lack of diffused knowledge and awareness. Most people don't know that their tax dollars are going to fuel Saudi Arabian airstrikes on a starving Yemeni population. One might relate to Yemen on a, humanita on a humanitarian basis, um, you know, because they're starving, they have this cholera, they're being bombed. Um, and, you know, it's the right thing to do. We should support Yemen on a humanitarian basis. Um, but revolutionary intercommunalism goes deeper than that. We're more involved than we think because we're the ones that are funding this military campaign. Same thing with Israel. You don't have to care about Palestinian lives, but you should know that when you get that check in the mail and it tells you the money that you made, <laughs> that you earned, and it tells you the money you actually received, there's a difference. Um, and that difference is going to Israel and Saudi Arabia um, and other places where we, we pretty much, most people don't know, like that's, that's the reality of it. Um, so once we start to see our oppressors as a single entity, it helps us relate to one another. Because the same capitalists that are invested in the Middle, East, Middle Eastern oil and lobby our representatives to go to war, the same capitalists that are invested in the prison industrial complex and lobby our politicians to pass legislation that would lock more black and brown people up. The profits they're making from the prisons, the profits they're making from the oil, and the profits they're making from the weapons manufacturing via our defense budget is all going to the same small circle of elites. So what choice do we have to stand together? This is intercommunalism. This is revolutionary intercommunalism. It's more than just being sympathetic to one another. Sympathy is a start, but it goes much deeper than that. Once we recognize that we're being oppressed by the same institutions, we realize that our labor and resources are being extracted everywhere within the same system and it opens some doors up once we start to see things like this. Um, but I'm, I'm under the belief that everything starts with education and nuance. Um, the dialectical materialist believes that everything in existence has fundamental internal contradictions. For example, African gods south of the Sahara always had two heads, one for good and one for evil. This is an internal contradiction. On the other hand, the West has a tendency to divide things up as good and evil, black and white. Um, it's, it's kind of like an oversimplification of things, simplification of things um, for their agenda. Um, so I'm going to use the example of Syria. So we know Assad isn't a good leader. His, son, his dad wasn't a good guy, and he's not a good guy. He shouldn't have power. This leadership is wrong, but that doesn't make U.S. imperialism right. This is a very complicated conflict with a long list of local and international players, from the regime to ISIS to Al-Qaeda or whatever the hell they're calling themselves these days, the Al-Nusra Front. Um, to, the, to dozens of small proxies within the U.S. that the U.S. is funding and dozens of small Islamic extremist groups. Um, there are people being killed for being Sunni. There are people being killed for being Shia. There are people being killed for being Christian. There are people being killed for being Yazidi. There are people being killed by ISIS. There's people being killed by the regime. There's people being killed by the rebels. And there's people being killed by oh, Al-Nusra Front, which is the rebels, Al-Qaeda. Um, but all over the news, uh, we hear Assad is killing his own people. And this is true. And God bless the people that lost their lives and homes fighting in Aleppo. But this didn't happen in a vacuum, and they weren't the only ones being killed. The Observatory for Human Rights in Syria reported that there were just as many civilians killed by the rebels as by the regime. Rebel groups you don't hear about in the news. You only hear about Assad. And it's not a coincidence. Because the reality is the United States doesn't give a, excuse my language, a flying fuck about Syrian lives. Um, they just care about being able to spin it to meet their own agenda. Um, and that's the same reason you don't hear about Yemen, which according to the UN is statistically the greatest humanitarian crisis in the world right now. Um, like the worst crisis they've ever dealt with. 
but you don't hear about it on the news because why would the news why would the news expose what's happening in Yemen when it's our tax dollars that's funding that? I take take another example of Aleppo and Mosul, um, two very very devastated cities, one in Syria and one in Iraq. I said one devastated by Assad and one devastated by ISIS. Aleppo got outstanding media coverage. The hashtag Pray for Aleppo. Um, all over social media, every major news network reporting live from Aleppo. What about Mosul? Mosul is statistically worse on every level. More destruction, more displacement, and more death. The reason they're not reporting on Mosul as much as Aleppo is because reporting on Mosul doesn't fulfill a foreign policy objective. The United States doesn't need to bring attention to people dying in Iraq. They need to bring attention to people dying in Syria because they already invaded Iraq. Um, and keep in mind that there are 22 states in the Middle East that are client states of the United States, and there's one that's a client state of Russia, and Syria is the client state of Russia. Um, so it's not a coincidence that um, you know the United States doesn't want Assad in power. Um, so pretty much what they did is they said, okay, we're gonna we're gonna report on Syrian deaths, but not all Syrian deaths. Syrian deaths by the regime. And they're not necessarily presenting false information, just selective information. If you understood the politics and powers involved in the region, it would be much harder to come up with a simple solution like remove Assad or no fly zone. Because you understand that it's not a simple problem. And I'm not, I'm not an Assad fan at all. Um, but when John Kerry met with the leaders of, um, of the Syrian uh, rebel groups, he asked them if they wanted a, a free election. He said we would get every single person inside and outside of Syria a ballot. Um, and the rebels refused because the complicated reality of the situation is if there was a general election, Assad would win, um, which is another internal contradiction. And these are things that need to be confronted along with Assad and along with confronting the regime because it's important to take all the, all the factors into consideration. By limiting the perceived scope of the conflict and excluding actors in the conflict, the U.S. frames the event as black and white to gain uh, public support for military intervention. So we have to keep in mind that every country is different. We have to recognize that there's a lot of similarities, too. One thing we can connect the dots on is looking at countries imperialized by the United States before and after imperialization. Take Iraq. We were giving Saddam money to, to fight Iran. They were support. That was the that was our guy over there for a while. Um, um, and then in our quest quest to remove him, we pretty much destroyed the whole infrastructure of Iraq. Um, and in our sanctions against Iraq, which we know that didn't affect Saddam and just affect the Iraqi people, um, it was estimated over 500,000 children died. When Bill Clinton's Secretary of State Madeleine Albright was asked if the 500,000 children deaths were, were worth it, um, she said yes. At one point in Baghdad, there were only two ambulances because they were considered war equipment. They, they weren't even letting pencils into Iraq because technically you can coat tanks with graphite and they won't show up on a, on a radar. Like that's how bad Iraq was at, at one point and it still is just as bad if not worse. This is in essence U.S. imperialism. My final example is Libya. Libya is the cautionary tale. Look what U.S. intervention looks like when there's no anti-war movement, when other Arab nations support it too. When NATO intervened, the economy went to shit, all benefits were gone, and three states, and it got divided into three states, and one of the states is controlled by ISIS. There's an open slave market in Libya where West Africans are being sold on the block, and it's a reaction to Gaddafi, who considered himself African, and so the rebels are now reacting with the ultimate racism. From the days of the Mushahideen, the U.S. has been doing the same exact thing, and each time it unleashes a force that's more damaging to the world than the previous. And with the lack of historical context and nuanced understanding of it, we almost fell into the same trap with Syria. We had, we had, uh, we had pro-Palestinian activists tweeting, bomb them. Like, that's, that's how bad it got. So one might think, you know, I got my own problems over here. What does any of this have to do with me? Everything is happening. All this is happening on the other side of the world, and it's not like I don't have my own problems here. Um, and I'll tell you, the connection between U.S. imperialism and police brutality is a powerful one. It's something I want to mention. All these leftovers from these imperialist adventures have been given to the police force, making them increasingly militarized. Adding to that, like countries we fund, like Israel, and give weapons to, we go train our, our police force there. I'm from D.C., and when, after the police force went and trained in Israel, they came back and they keep their lights on at all times. 
because it instills fear. So people know that they're there all the time. Um, so, I mean, and these are our tax dollars going to Israel. And then it's our tax dollars going to the police force. And then our tax dollars sending this police force to Israel so they can learn how to oppress us from the masters of oppression. Um, and it goes even deeper than that. Um, like, for example, all the money that should be going to climate change right now has been averted to the defense budget. Um, and that's why we're seeing so many natural disasters. We hear about all these things. We hear about um, terrorists and bombs and nuclear attacks. But somebody said it the other day, we were defeated by standing water. Um, you know, places like Puerto Rico, Flint, Florida, and Houston, like some of this stuff could have been averted. Like there should be money in, in going into climate change. It was being a burden to the defense budget. Um, so to wrap things up, we just have to start looking at things in nuance. The problems we face are very complicated at home and abroad. And this is why the dialectical materialist believes that everything in existence has fundamental internal contradictions. And it's only through revolution, revolutionary intercommunalism and nuanced education that we'll overcome our oppressors. Nothing more and nothing less. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I can have kind of a big mouth, so you let me know if I need to move the mic down. Um, <clears throat> so I will, of course, our theme of our panel, revolutionary intercommunalism and our global struggle for peace. And I'm so glad Sam uh, mentioned the leaders he did, whom uh, Dr. Newton met, met with, uh, I think before he was doctor. Um, but uh, he also met with uh, leader of the Palestine Liberation Organization, Chairman Yasser Arafat in 1971. Um, so as part of my talk, and I'm going to try to keep it brief, hopefully we'll have time for discussion because um, the question and answer is the most exciting part for me. Um, but I am going to show you a couple of graphic photos. Um, if we're going to talk about the truth, you got to see the truth. It's not that bad, not blood and gore, but there, it is um, disturbing and that's on purpose. Um, so we already got a beautiful introduction from Samud, uh, but uh, I will just highlight in February 1971, Dr. Newton wrote, the world today is a dispersed collection of communities and the concept of intercommunalism was to describe the relationships between these communities. As he described, uh, reactionary intercommunalism was the state of the world in 1971 that one community using available technology was dominating, using that technology to dominate all the others. And this was the description of American empire. We can still relate today. Uh, but what he introduced was the concept of revolutionary intercommunalism, which was the concept that all communities would use that available technology to support themselves and one another. The solution is really that simple. And Dr. Newton wrote, there are only differences in degree between what's happening to the blacks here and what's happening to all of the people in the world, including Africans. Their needs are the same and their energy is the same. And the contradictions they suffer will only be resolved when the people establish a revolutionary intercommunalism where they share all the wealth that they produce and live in one world. Also, I'm gonna read this, so to read it along with you, by no means do I, um, I think or pretend that I can speak as uh, Dr. Newton spoke. Um, so on the concept of revolutionary intercommunalism, I'm going to relate to you briefly the story of how the first part of my life was how I failed at this. Uh, growing up uh, as a person of color, a brown person of color, I had a choice to associate with a minority or to assimilate. And um, you know, I have a lot of compassion for where I was growing up, but I chose to assimilate. Um, these are my parents. Uh, my dad, uh, may he rest in peace, uh, he passed away in 2012. He was an Arab Muslim, originally from Iraq, born and raised there, came here for his education uh, and was at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., where he met the woman who would be my mom, a nice Jewish girl from New York. So they actually literally carried out revolutionary intercommunalism, combining the communities, um, but it didn't work out so well. And I am writing a book about that. Um, 
and it will give you an overview of my years in therapy of growing up in that household. Um, but uh, so, and my mom was born and raised in the U.S., but her parents uh, were Austrian Jews who uh, fled Hitler. They were um, European Holocaust survivors. I want to say, I make an effort to say European Holocaust because the way we have that in conversation, it's as if there's only ever been one. And that is one of many, many that have yet to be uh, acknowledged. So um, in Arab culture, parents want their children, you have three choices. Doctor, engineer, professor. This will make your father happy. Um, in Jewish families, traditionally, I mean, everybody's going to be happy with a doctor in the family, but it's sort of the reputation culturally that uh, Jewish mothers want either their kids to go either into medicine or law. So I was like, okay, I want to make my parents happy, and uh, I agreed to carry out the plan that was laid before me, and I went to medical school here in the U.S. Now, my mom, her father, my grandfather, was a very distinguished uh, pathologist back in the day in New York. Um, and my father knew the medical system of his home country in Iraq. They were unaware of the history of the U.S. system and the reality of, of the U.S. system that persists today. And I did not come across this book until two years ago, years after my medical education. Um, and when I started to read this book, all of a sudden, the light bulbs went on. And I said, I finally had a context for what I witnessed. I had context for what I participated in. I had context for my implementation of racism in the medical field. This is a book by Dr. Harriet A. Washington, Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present. This is the system that I was, I was seeking to become a noble physician, but I was party to crimes. And perhaps they, uh, I haven't considered it, but I don't see why not they can't be considered crimes against humanity when you're supposed to be uh, caring for people's well-being. Uh, another, in another part of town, West Philadelphia, I attended medical school at the University of Pennsylvania. I earned my degree in 1997. West Philadelphia it was already starting to be gentrified at the time that I attended school there. It is unrecognizable to me today. Um, it was not until I picked up this book two years ago uh, that I learned about uh, the dermatology experiments that were conducted on prisoners in the 1960s uh, through the University of Pennsylvania. And the, um, everything was quote unquote legal because they had signed consent forms from the prisoners. But this is obviously a vulnerable and trapped population that were not told what they were getting into. And there's a film called Acres of Skin um, that uh, you may want to find a book uh, that you may want to follow up with. So that was the system, just one piece of the system there. Um, and my part was to accept and perpetrate the dehumanization. It was a predominantly poor, predominantly black population of West Philadelphia that I was uh, learning on and uh, I became a party to it. And in my book, I will uh, go into more detail about um, uh, one of the most disturbing things that I won't go into right now, but that I was a party to. Um, after I graduated from medical school, I thought I wanted to be a surgeon. As it turned out, I did not. Um, but I was in, uh, for two years a surgical re general surgical resident at University of Maryland in Baltimore. Uh, and there are, I have a, a whole list of, in retrospect, incidences of malpractice at the University of Maryland. You may be fil uh, familiar with um, the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks and how Hopkins was the, um, the medical center um, that back in the 50s was the only uh, medical center that, wa that would care for, uh, for African Americans. Um, but I experienced across town that things, the same mentality of we have a poor black population, that they are privileged to get our care, so we are using them. Um, it's the same mentality. And one of the worst cases that uh, my name is on that chart, um, I didn't realize what had happened till after the fact, but um, 
A thoracotomy, which is a surgery uh, on your chest, can be one of the most painful surgeries that you can go through as a human being. And there was a patient at the VA center in Baltimore. He had lung cancer. The cancer had already spread to his brain and he had had treatment for the brain metastases. Once you're, the cancer spreads to the brain, um, no further surgery is indicated. Um, it, it's actually contraindicated because of the intensity of the surgery. You can't cure it at that point once it has spread. Um, but one of the surgeons at the University of Maryland Hospital, who's now um, at an elite cancer center on the East Coast, he took that man to the OR and performed a thor thoracotomy and removed his lung that can be for no other reason than to practice. This man was a veteran, he was at the VA, he was poor, he was a little bit slow, um, and uh, he was a very kind man, and uh, I carry that with me, and this is, the opportunity to speak with you today is very important for me um, to be a part of this conversation um, and to be here with you in this community as I have, um, I have a lot of amends to make. Um, and my own dehumanization of my patients at the time. It's the system, and even though you want to do good, you become part of a system. And there's just, you know, it's understandable, it will never be acceptable. This has to be addressed, I am quite sure, because each generation trains the next one. Now, I also want to point out, I went to a very elite um, Ivy League school. And I expect that my experience may have been different if I attended a historically black uh, medical school. Um, this is, this is my, my hope. Um, but, however, the whole system has been, um, has been continued um, as the book on medical apartheid describes. I'm sorry, I got a little off track there. A little bit lost in my own trauma. Thank you for ba bearing with me. Um, I ultimately left the practice of medicine it was quite a messy leave. I actually, um, you could call it a nervous breakdown. Um, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I closed the book on that part of my life and began work on social justice activism. Um, and so, so I have come to question, is being a doctor always an honorable role? There is institutionalized bigotry in the US system of medical training. And this impedes revolutionary intercommunalism in a community that I believe should lead. You should have physicians at the forefront advocating for mental health, for physical health. And as we see by the extensive killings by police and the brutality by police of predominantly black, brown, and indigenous uh, in this country today, this is a public health issue. And I would like to see physicians at the forefront of addressing that. So that is my history, my past, my experience. And I want to address one more system that is known as honorable that I believe impedes uh, revolutionary intercommunalism. Now, all respect to Colin Kaepernick, such a courageous stand uh, in, in the environment today, <clears throat> and he's put everything on the line. Uh, he began sitting for the anthem, saying, I'm not going to stand up to take pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color. There are bodies in the street and people getting paid leave and getting away with murder. Now, then there became an outcry that this was insulting to the military. So he made a decision <coughs> to kneel to honor the military. But this is, I want to challenge that, that step. I will argue this. If the U.S. military is actually defending our freedoms, then there would be no reason to have a protest in the first place. We would have social justice being defended by that military. Now, I also want to underscore that <coughs> military recruiters target poor neighborhoods, which are predominantly minority neighborhoods. So this is the reason I'm challenging this, because there's the military spends tens of thousands of dollars on new recruits that could give them edu an education, but that's tax dollars on new recruits. So we have to ask these questions. Let me challenge the U.S. military as military playing an honorable role. If the U.S. military defended our freedoms, they would protect poor people from the police. Who are they collaborating with in Ferguson? What threat is this man on the ground? Ferguson, Baltimore, the National Guard came in to protect the wealth at the Inner Harbor and to defend the police. 
So I want to challenge this. They're defending my freedoms. Well, my freedoms should be here. They're not in Iraq. They're not in Afghanistan. They're not in Niger. Sorry, Niger. Sorry, I messed that up. Um, our freedoms aren't over there. But oil is. Other natural resources are. Uranium is in Niger. Now, if we know, I just, I throw in CENTCOM and AFRICOM. I don't believe it's an accident that the first African-American president led an invasion of an African country and put troops on the African continent. <laughs> and, and much of the public felt good about it. Um, and also, our freedoms are not over there, and these children were not in the way of our freedoms. But this is what happens with drone strikes and air strikes and illegal invasions. So, Muhammad, the late great Muhammad Ali, in no way am I going to match his voice, but he told, gave us his opinion. Why should they ask me to put on a uniform and go 10,000 miles from home and drop bombs and bullets on brown people in Vietnam while so-called Negro people in Louisville are treated like dogs and denied simple human rights? No, I am not going 10,000 miles from home to help murder and burn another poor nation simply to continue the domination of white slave masters of the darker people the world over. <laughs> An incredible stand at such a critical time. He put so much on the line. He ha was a man of incredible faith and incredible courage and uh, I emulate him to this day. So I'm going to argue that the U.S. military is a dangerous environment. Now, is this everybody in the U.S. military? No. But not everybody in the United States of America is waving a Confederate flag. But we know that the racism and the bigotry and the white supremacy is pervasive. It's more dangerous in the military because it's more concentrated. And another line from Muhammad Ali that really spoke it all during a time, and this moved people to become more anti-war. April 4th, 1967 was the day that Martin Luther King Jr. gave his speech at Riverside Church saying, the greatest purveyor of violence today is my own government. One year to the day, they killed him. He crossed a line. So today, has anything changed in the last 50 years? This is a U.S. soldier in an oil tanker loaded with gold in Iraq. I'm telling you, it's the system. You may not be, have a mentality of white supremacy, but you are following orders. You cannot fight the system. And this is one of the saddest, most humiliating images that I have come across in all the blood and gore of the pictures I've looked at. This is the reality of military occupation. This is what veterans come home and a lot of come home with guilt which makes them want to kill themselves but this is I know I don't know what any of these individuals are thinking having these prisoners of war um, degraded and stripped naked before them but I wonder if the African-American man is thinking to himself this is how my parents were brought to America chained to the bottom of slave ships Revolutionary intercommunalism, the theory was in opposition to American empire. It called for unity of oppressed communities globally. So I return to the stance of Dr. Newton visiting leaders of oppressed peoples globally. And it continues today. It is already in action. These are um, Black Lives Matter of Denver, Colorado, standing with the indigenous of Standing Rock. That's the beauty of revolutionary intercommunalism. Uh, Palestine, there was a lot of solidarity between Ferguson and pa Palestinians saying, here's how, you do, here's how we deal with tear gas, here's what you can do when you're under a military occupation. And that love goes both ways. And I myself now, to make amends for uh, what I have in my past, have come back to uh, the people of uh, Baltimore to stand with them in their uprising after the murder of Freddie Gray. Um, I got a long way to go, but as Dr. Newton said, it's not a question of when the revolution comes. The revolution is always going on. It's not a question of when the revolution is going to be. The revolution is going on every day, every minute, because the new is always struggling against the old. I am the old, you are the new. It is a privilege for me to share this time with you on this day of revolution. Thank you so much for having me here.
Uh, so I'm going to discuss uh, Huey Newton's Lessons for World Revolution in Our Time. First, though, to discuss the significance of Huey P. Newton and the theory of revolutionary intercommunalism in the same space as Mumia Abu-Jamal, Yvonne King, and Regina Jennings is more than the word honor can describe. A big thanks again to the Black and Brown Coalition for putting this conference together. The <laughs> So the foundations for this conference reminded me of what Huey P. Newton said at the Revolutionary People's Convention in 1970, which was also held at Temple. We who are gathered here by our presence do resolve to liberate our communities from the boot and whip of the oppressor so that people of goodwill may live their lives free from want, free from fear, and free from need. Huey Newton helped me take this pledge. As an alienated subject of empire, my family's history cannot be separated from the U.S. imperialist war on Vietnam's just struggle for socialism. The Agent Orange that was sprayed over the lands of a quarter of the country and the imperial violence experienced by the people of Vietnam left an indelible mark on my personal history. Vietnam's victory over the U.S., so repressed by the popular mythology of the U.S. empire, led me to search for the truth about U.S. wars not found in Ken Burns' documentaries. Huey Newton helped me find the truth. He helped me see this period as one marked by war. Few others have raised the people's subjective consciousness to the conditions of war and have prepared them to fight for global peace, as Huey P. Newton. Huey conceptualized peace not as an abstract idea, but a material condition rooted in the interconnected development of history and political economy. The path he traveled to become a revolutionary warrior for peace was paved by the reality of endless war. He observed two forms of war. He founded the Black Panther Party first as a self-defense organization of the black working class trapped in ghettos and terrorized by the police. That was the first front of war. Huey then emphasized that black people also needed to defend themselves from what the police protected, capitalism's impoverishment of the black community. He connected the police occupation of the black community to expand white capitalist profit to the wars waged by the US military abroad for the same purpose. He believed that black liberation was impossible without the support of the colonial peoples waging wars for national liberation and socialism all around the world. Huey's understanding of war propelled the Black Panther Party into a vanguard position in the world revolutionary movement for peace and socialism. His leadership represented the best of the black radical tradition's long history of international solidarity with the oppressed worldwide. He was instrumental in the development of the Black Panther Party's international chapters in nations such as North Korea and Algeria, and organized a delegation to socialist China just prior to Nixon's historic trip in 1972. But Huey was neither an adventurist nor a dogmatist. He was a Marxist-Leninist and believed that theory had to be grounded in the material reality of the people if it is to bring about revolutionary change. Huey Newton was a student of history who sought to advance the people to a higher level of consciousness than what had been achieved in prior generations of black struggle. That's why he developed the theory of revolutionary intercommunalism. He observed that U.S. imperialism was evolving into a high-tech global empire. That empire degraded the condition of working class people to the status of unemployable. He also observed that the U.S. empire didn't allow colonized nations to exercise independence without the threat of war. Advances in technology and the concentration of capital had placed humanity into one global village. Oppressed people faced the same oppressor not as nations, but as communities. Some of these communities, like socialist China, had liberated their territories and formed socialist planned economies. Still others were completely dispossessed of the state power required to determine their own destinies. Revolutionary intercommunalism was Huey's contribution to Marxist theory as it applied to black people and oppressed people worldwide. Imperialism was the central question. The people's wars that were raging in Vietnam, Mozambique, and Uruguay when Huey introduced the concept in 1970 
were profoundly important in the development of the theory. Huey studied their successes and their failures. He urged the Black Panther Party to reach out to national liberation movements wherever they resided. In a letter to the National Liberation Front of South Vietnam, he explained that, quote, our struggle for liberation is based upon justice and equality for all men. Thus, we are interested in the people of any, t any territory where the crack of the, uh, of the whip of the oppressor may be heard. We have the obligation to take the concept of internationalism to its final conclusion, the destruction of statehood itself. This will lead us to an era where the withering away of the state will occur and men will extend their hand in friendship throughout the world. Revolutionary intercommunalism presented a practical guide toward the goal of a classless world. That meant, as Huey explained, quote, it is imperative to defend people of color where they, when they are attacked by American troops in other lands. These attacks are designed to continue the profit-mongering of the ruling class, end quote. The first lesson of revolutionary intercommunalism, then, is to oppose U.S. imperialist war, period. The second is to unite with oppressed peoples subject to U.S. imperialist war in a common program for human emancipation. What else do we learn from revolutionary intercommunalism? We learn that the question of class is in fact not a matter of mere economics. That class is what shapes the interests of the global order and is attached to any real understanding of white supremacy or racism. That figures like ta Coates talk about race as a static phenomenon detached from material reality, all in, name, all in the name of personal class gain. The class from which Coates belongs ignores the world in its entirety. It makes attractive statements about the racist roots of the United States, but fails to acknowledge who those roots serve and how they serve them. It is much easier to lay the blame of, for oppression on white American foot soldiers of white supremacy than to look at the class in power especially if your goal is to be that class or make peace with that class. Revolutionary intercommunalism, however, is about waging a people's war for real peace in our time. We are faced with a dangerous global situation, more dangerous than the one Huey inherited. The U.S. imperialist system is playing with a world war scenario that has the potential to be more destructive than any war ever known to humanity. A bipartisan consensus exists in the halls of Washington and the US military to wage war on Russia, China, and whatever independent political force gets in the way of their quest for unquestioned hegemony and guaranteed profit for the military, finance, and corporate capitalists, even if it means rendering the planet to nuclear dust. Millions have died in the US military's endless war on the people of Syria, Iraq, and Libya. The DPRK, a friend of the Black Panther Party, hangs on to independence despite a constant barrage of US-backed provocations in the Korean Peninsula. Africa is almost entirely occupied by the US military in the hopes that China will cease economic activity with the resource-rich continent. Political chaos and economic stagnation prevail in much of the world, especially in the so-called developed countries in the US and Western orbit. Yet war and peace is not the question on the order of the day for most who are engaged in the struggle for social justice of any kind. There is little identification with the oppressed classes of the world because few in the struggle identify as a class. Few US-based left tendencies, organizations, and groups offer concrete solidarity to oppressed people facing the same enemy that exists here. In fact, a lot of them repeat the mantras of the empire and place themselves in the imperialist camp. Not only have the people of Syria, Libya, Korea, and elsewhere suffered from this fatal error, but so too have poor and working class people in the US suffered, especially the black poor. Black wealth is approaching zero, joblessness and poverty is rampant, and the mass incarceration state refuses to let up in a period where it takes nearly a trillion US tax dollars to maintain US military supremacy worldwide. It is as if we should forget that the NYPD receives training in Israel, or the same weapons deployed to local police against the black community are used to arm US-backed fascists in Ukraine, Syria, and elsewhere. We are living in an era characterized by full-spectrum counterinsurgency warfare enforced by the dominant class. As Huey proclaimed, the roots of the endless war that exists in the world is what unites the oppressed beyond national boundaries. 
Black Americans share a common enemy with the Syrians, Libyans, Russians, yes, that's right, Russians, and Venezuelans, to name just a few. That enemy, U.S. imperialism, is more consolidated than during the era of the Panthers. Technology has advanced and confirmed Huey's analysis that a mass of unemployed proletarian workers would disrupt the economic stability of the system. U.S. imperialism is more desperate than the, 20, the 21st century than maybe ever before. It can no longer invade or indebt its way out of <coughs> economic slowdown. The markets have dried up, and much of the planet is looking to China to provide relief amid the destruction that U.S. domination has wrought. As the con contradictions become more acute, revolutionary intercommunalism helps inform the answer to the question, where do we go from here? We can begin to answer this question by recognizing that the method that Huey utilized to devise the theory of revolutionary intercommunalism is just as important as the contents of the theory itself. Revolutionary intercommunalism was a specific application of Marxist theory to existing historical conditions. It required a deep study and investigation into the developments of the historical epoch from which Huey lived. The precarious position of the black poor and the explosive wars that led the US empire to impose this on the peoples of the world led Huey to the conclusion that exploited people in the US mainland had to transcend their understanding of what a nation was. The US was no longer a nation, it was an empire attempting to destroy national liberation and struggles abroad in a similar manner to which it violently opposed any effort by black America to form its own nation. And black America desperately needed international alliances if they were to gain the strength necessary to defeat a global enemy. So the most appropriate way to celebrate revolutionary intercommunalism is to study Huey Newton's methodology. First, we must assist the masses in applying intercommunal thought to the present condition. We must investigate global developments and make firm conclusions about who can be trusted as friends of the exploited and the oppressed and who are the enemies of peace and liberation. Huey used the framework of dialectical materialism, which gave him an understanding that all development is a struggle between contradictions. Contradictions inevitably produce stage as specific stages of their development process. We must harness this mode of thought and understand the forces at play at our current stage of development. Second, we must understand that the conclusions we come to in the 21st century will differ in form, but not in substance, to Huey's interpretation. A specter of crisis haunts the U.S. imperialist system that was unknown five decades ago. The U.S. is in fact losing its grip on hegemony in the world, especially in the economic realm. U.S. imperialism's total share of the world economy is shrinking. China, a developed socialist economy, is set to surpass the U.S. as the largest in the world in the coming years. This has sent U.S. imperialism into a state of desperation launching war after war in the hopes that the world will submit to its continued domination. On the domestic front, there are signs that the masses are rudely awakening to the reality that U.S. imperialism has little to offer but misery and alienation. That was the lesson of the last election season. U.S. imperialism's crisis is defined by a terminal decline in all spheres of society. More than half of the population in the U.S. is poor and unable to pay for $500 emergencies when they arise. Health care remains in private hands and the costs keep rising. Police repression in poor black communities continues to intensify. Low-wage jobs and unemployment dominate the economic landscape as automation compels workers to work faster and longer for less pay. The war on the poor is the only means that the system has left to maximize profit Yet this has come at a significant cost to both the masses and the rulers. The masses feel the burden of poverty and the rulers feel the coming storm of collapse when reality sets in that what the poor produces cannot be absorbed back into the economy without producing harsher and ever more burdensome crises. Huey Newton taught us that the inherent contradictions of U.S. imperialism eventually lead to seismic change. He taught us that the war at home is the war abroad. There is no time to allow so-called leftists who spend their time condemning oppressed people worldwide to continue to lead. These forces must be isolated and their positions thrown into the dustbin of history. New relations among people in the U.S. will be born out of a deep consciousness of the condition of the oppressed under the gun of empire. 
Revolutionary intercommunalism was Huey's call to investigate the common experience of exploited classes and act on this investigation by developing an international political program that can strengthen our struggle in the belly of the empire. We can start putting Huey's theory into practice by extending a hand of friendship and solidarity to the targets of empire. The people of the world, though always empathetic to the struggles of oppressed people in the US, cannot possibly trust a movement that does not recognize their rightful struggle against US imperialism. Unlike charities or NGOs, which are designed to enrich the oligarchy and subvert self-determination, intercommunal solidarity is driven by the people themselves. If we conclude that oppressed communities share a common enemy, then we must plan a course of action that will bring our common struggle to a victorious conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Lastly, we'll have Megan and Chandra, and then after that, we'll have time for two discussion questions. Yes, Megan. Uh, Um, hello, thank you everybody. Um, so I'd like to start with something that uh, Yvonne actually said at the Saturday Free School. Um, she said, or something like this, the system is people so focused on differences that they do not make systemic analyses. What I have learned from revolutionary elders is how essential it is to study and produce ideas so that we can move from reacting against the system to changing the system. The genius of Dr. Huey Newton is that he is constantly uncovering the true nature of the American war machine so that the people can understand who their enemy is. Unfortunately, the dominant mode of doing politics in the American university is not the politics to tear down the war machine and free humanity, but the politics of identity. We are obsessed with pointing out difference at the cost of coming to a systemic analysis of why things are the way they are and how they could be different. The latest version of this is the anti-fascist movement. Who are the fascists? Did they start operating with the election of Donald Trump? Identity politics has been co-opted by the universities which can speak of protecting minorities and building safe spaces while gentrifying surrounding neighborhoods exploiting black workers, and doing research for an ever more efficient war machine. I would like to speak today about difference itself as a tool of neocolonialism, or as Huey said, reactionary intercommunalism. It is a way that the West m maintains control over the world. It is a way that the white world partitions the people so they fight with each other rather than uniting against the war machine so that humanity can be whole. I will use reactionary intercommunalism to understand the partitioning of India and explain the idea of intercivilizational unity, which is an idea of the Saturday Free School, as an antidote to the political and psychological poison of empire. By unity, I do not mean the absence of difference. I mean an end to the system of Western domination that makes difference a problem by concentrating power into the hands of an extreme few and leaving everybody else to fight over the crumbs. In his speech in Boston University, Huey starts out by explaining the current state of world capitalism, as my fellow panelists have beautifully described and the panel before has put into practice, um, <laughs> which is why it's very intimidating to speak after them. <laughs> um, Huey Newton applied the scientific method of dialectical materialism to material reality and understood the world. That nation states had become obsolete as imperialist powers extended their economic, political, and technological and cultural domination across boundary lines. Western technology indoctrinates people all over the world with the values of individualism, selfishness, and greed. He understood that it is an extremely small number of people who drive the war machine that extends its claws all over humanity. They rob the people of the resources that could be used for human development, and they murder people if they reject the American way of life. We can see the effects of reactionary intercommunalism through the partition of India. 
After three centuries, and that's just the British, there was the Dutch and the Portuguese first, of looting, <laughs> murdering, and pillaging, the British left one of the richest and most advanced civilizations in the world, a poor, illiterate, and divided nation. To justify themselves, they said that they gave us civilization. In reality, they destroyed it. The British left in 1947 after the masses in solidarity with the African-American people waged a heroic struggle to free India. Of course, when they left, they never really left. They split India into two, India and Pakistan. Overnight, millions of people left their communities behind in the name of religious differences. They broke their civilization, which was founded on the unity of the people, in two. Since the rebellion of 1847, when the Hindus and Mis Muslims united to throw out the British, the British had pushed the idea that Hindus and Muslims could not live together, that the people wanted a division so minorities could be safe, and that Islam and Hinduism were two fundamentally different worldviews. We can understand the real reason for this memorandum from deep in the archive, from this memorandum from deep in the archives of the British war machine. And this is their words, this is the, we uh, the words of the imperialists. The Indus Valley, Western Punjab, and Balochistan are vital to any strategic plans for the defense of the all-important Muslim belt, the oil supplies of the Middle East. If one looks upon this area as a strategic wall against Soviet, fo Soviet expansionism, the five most important bricks in the wall are Turkey, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Only through the open ocean port of Karachi could the opponents of the Soviet Union take immediate and effective countermeasures. If the British Commonwealth and the United States of America are to be in a position to defend their vital interests in the Middle East, then the best and most stable area from which to conduct this defense is from Pakistan. Pakistan is the keynote of the strategic arch of the wide and vulnerable waters of the Indian Ocean. The words of the imperialists could not be more clear. The ambitions of British and American empire to create Pakistan resulted in the deaths of millions of people. Overnight, people who had lived for centuries as brothers and sisters became enemies. Soldiers were ordered to stand by as women were raped, homes were looted, and the people were murdered. Hatred between Hindus and Muslims grew, and India and Pakistan have been war at, at war with each other ever since. Pakistan has become a pawn in the American war against terror, and India is under the spell of Hindu, Hindu nationalism and neoliberal domination. And our culture is, is, is being destroyed by that same technological imperialism. You can see a Bollywood movie for, for um, evidence of that, recent Bollywood movies that have come out. Ultimately, it didn't matter that India became its own nation. Empire remained. It ensured that the masses of India could never achieve their dreams of a socialist republic. It is fashionable in universities to talk about India either as a growing capitalist power and America's own image, or as a hateful, sexist, casteist, Islam Islamophobic, and racist place, the same way they talk about working people. <laughs> Both stances are the viewpoint of the ruling class. They are rooted in a contempt for the people and a cowardly pessimism. At the Saturday Free School for Black Philosophy and Liberation, we take a different view of the poor and working peoples of the world the people who are, who are at the forefront of the movement to change history. Huey talks about revolutionary intercommunalism as the inevitable result of reactionary in intercommunalism. He meant that communities all over the world, including the black community in the United States, will liberate themselves by standing up to imperial domination and tearing down empire so they can redistribute resources on a world scale. At the Saturday Free School, we extend our understanding of revolutionary intercommunalism to inter-civilizational unity. Like Huey, we see the nation state as an obsolete concept. It has come from European civilization and is alien for the people they colonized and partitioned. We believe in a rebirth of civilizations and the unity of the people under the principles of humanity. A civilization is the sum of millennia of human history. Rather than belonging to the elite few, it is the common heritage of humanity. Rather than being dead in the history books, it is being constantly re remade as the people struggle for their liberation. From the Twa people who invented human language 
to the black Sudan, which protected and refined ancient knowledge when Greece and Rome collapsed. Darker peoples have shaped human history and have driven the world spirit for human liberation. And as Dr. Jennings was talking about with astrology, our entire understanding of knowledge and liberation comes from the darker nations. Jazz comes out of black American civilization. Buddhism is a liberation movement of the Indian civilization against meaningless ritual and the caste system. Islam is a source of revolutionary inspiration for martyrs like Hussein and Al-Halaj who stood up against tyranny by those who called themselves Muslims. Civilizations are alive in the life worlds of poor and working people of the darker nations. In order to understand our civilizations, we must come from a place of love for the people. We must see them in all their contradictions and draw on the best of their traditions so we can evolve into new human beings, which is exactly what the imperialists do not want. Anybody who can see the hysteria on CNN or in the voices of white liberals can understand that American civilization is on the decline. The biggest warmongers and thieves are losing. The only thing they have to export throughout the world is their weapons and their war. The election of Donald Trump and Brexit are only sad events if you are invested in the continuation of Western dominance all over the world. As W.E.B. Du Bois would say, the collapse of Europe is the condition for the freedom of humanity, socialism, and peace. As the sun sets on the white man's empire, the people can be free if revolutionaries can put out an alternative vision for the world. The struggle for peace and revolutionary intercommunalism is a struggle for the unity of the civilizations of Pan-Asia and Pan-Africa against the most barbaric forces in the world, Europe and America. We must begin by seeing the politics of identity for what they are, a way the ruling class divides us so that we blame each other for the results of their treachery. We must know who the enemy of humanity is so we can wage a struggle to free humanity as a whole. You know, leading um, movements here. You got Pam, Sister Pam Africa, you know, right here that's been doing the work for over 30 something years. So, I mean, just right there, you know, you got folks as myself that's doing stuff with the arts. I mean, you have people here that um, are doing things. You know, this is political education. It's, you know, fueling us, you know, to go out and keep continuing doing what we're doing. But it's folks here that are doing things. Right, no, I'm not, I'm not saying Hold on, let her, let her talk, let her talk. Let her talk. <laughs> so, so I just wanted to say that. You're not, 
you know, lost souls that, you know, came here. You know, people are out here that's, that's, that's doing the work. No, he's right. You're right, brother. You're right. You take this information and you go to action. He's right. And like she says, too, you, there's MOVE here. There's what other organizations there are here. So he's absolutely right because it's not enough for theory like he we said. You, you take your information and you put it into action. So you pick somebody and you do something. Because you know how it goes at Temple. See, if without theory, there, no, there can right be no, right. yeah, right, wait a minute. See, for you to ask that question after this brilliant panel mm -hmm. is a way of diminishing the brilliance of these presentations. Mm -hmm. what, they would, what they did successfully is to clarify the nature of the oppressor and the oppression. And what they said is that no problem that the people face can be solved without the struggle for peace. And the foundation of the struggle for peace is inner communalism. That's what you have to understand. I thought it was a brilliant panel, and so we should get on with the questions and comments. No, 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 wait a minute. Oh, let me just say something. No, I graduated Temple Pan African Studies. So what? Oh, that's right. And I have to say for you when I'm coming out. No, but I'm just saying, but wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. But we have to, wait a minute. But he's right, because I no, he's I'm not. I've been in the MOVE conference two months ago, and he's, he's right. You gotta ask. Listen. You gotta ask. But let me, no, let me no, say no, something. No, let me say something. In, wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Like, if she had brought her to the South Asian speech, no, I don't. But hold on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. But do you understand what this panel was designed to do? And I think we should get on with the discussion. This panel was designed to discuss a specific theoretical framework. A wait a minute, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. To establish a specific theoretical framework established by Huey P. Newton, which is seldom discussed in African American studies or any other kind of study. And, 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 we want to continue expanding that discussion. For anyone to ask the first question yes. of whether or what do we do next without understanding the theory is to diminish the brilliance of this panel. I would suggest to the chairman that we move forward. He made his point, let's go forward with the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And guys, please ask questions specific to the panel. Thank you, brother. Hey, oh, guys. Um, so, uh, so specifically about what Brandon said about identity politics or politics of identity, and also about um, generally how that's been used to divide people um, as part of like Asian Students Association here. There, there are like particular, there are understandings of how people are divided, but also people still trying to understand their own identity too, because, uh, because our identities are also still quite erased. Um, so from that point, how are we able to, um, how would we be able to both grow our identity while also not uh, being stuck in identity politics? From a very, from just like, you know, interacting with each other, but also a personal level too. Good question. I think that's a very good question. I would say that, in my experience and from what I've learned over the years from geniuses like Huey Newton, is that we have to understand where phenomenon come from, in in terms of the particular historical moment that we're in. And when we talk about identity politics, and I'm not going to speak for Megna, I'm sure she can speak for herself, but we're talking about a specific development, a response to black revolutionaries like Huey P. Newton to distort and dehistoricize and depoliticize a political movement that was destroyed and also was reformed away um, as a direct response to the political ideas of people like Huey Newton. And I think also from um, the perspective of trying to understand oneself. I don't think we can really understand ourselves unless we see each other as members of a world community. Mm -hmm. 
And we also can't understand ourselves if we don't understand the fact that our national identities, our racial identities are all marked by systemic oppression and the struggle between people uh, and their oppressors um, for their particular interests. So we, we don't have to say, oh, I don't know myself, you know, I'm, Viet- I'm, I'm part Vietnamese and you know, for a long time I didn't know who I was, I didn't know what that really meant for me. But it was only through uh, recognizing and coming into contact with people like Huey P. Newton that I begin to actually study who I was when he said, we need to send troops, we need to send Black Panthers to Vietnam, I was like, oh shit, I need to understand why he wanted to do that. And so, I, so then I started to study Vietnam. And I have this shirt, this, isn't, this is authentic shit. <laughs> I got this from somebody who had been there and I told me about you know, what socialism in Vietnam was and why there was such a fierce class struggle there and why the Black Panther Party was in solidarity with them. So I started to understand myself in the context of the system of oppression rather than from what identity politics does which is to place us as automated individuals separate from each other separate like like Vietnamese people are separate from black people because of you know uh, you know whatever some scholar in in the academy said rather than uh, why we're actually here you know why certain diasporas are in this country you know, for me, it's like the only reason I exist is because the U.S. Just attempted to destroy Vietnam. So that's how I kind of perceptualize, conceptualize identity <laughs> politics. Yeah. I mean, just learning from the, the elders, like Yvonne was, would tell us how um, in the party, like, you know, the, the women used to wear like berets and, and jackets. Um, because that was their way of being militant and identifying. But the party told them that they had to wear dresses. Because that, because, I mean, Yvonne could speak better than I could about it, but uh, wear dresses because people were alienated from that kind, of, um, that kind of pageantry. And so they wore dresses. And I just think that's a really, I think it's not about our own individual express. We can understand, like Danny was saying, we can understand ourselves as human divorced from the people. Um, and I think it's not about our own individual expression, but the way that we relate to a movement to free everybody. Um, yeah. Um, does anyone have another question for our panelists? Um, I have a question uh, pertaining to your uh, uh, talk right now about differences <coughs> and specifically uh, between men and women uh, inter- internal to our organizations. Um, what does it look like for men and women to be uni- in unity in an organization, specifically anti imperialist, without just washing over, without addressing the nuance of that difference? basically having a principled unity between men and women. Because I've been in multiple leftist organizations um, where there have been uh, sexual assault, um, sexual sexual assaults, and uh, it's not a good time. Well, that's interesting you asked Samir, considering we're part of the same organization. I mean, I think um, I think we have to believe in the revolutionary process and the way it can have us develop to be more than men and more than women. Um, like, you know, women taking on traditionally masculine roles as part of the party, and men taking on men discovering other parts of themselves that have been alienated by the patriarchal Western capitalist system. And I think in the process of struggling for liberation, we become more than these divisions and we can become who we always have been and who we are meant to be. Um, like Doc always talks about how he's, if you don't mind me <laughs> saying, I mean, he talks about how you know, he's learned so much from his mother um, and how part of who he is is his mother and 
you know, I think that's, and yeah, I mean, I think that's the, that's the consciousness of someone who's um, involved in a liberatory politics. Um, yeah.